we see things on the surface. We can sometimes discern things a little deeper, and that's up to Christ. We don't do that on our own. The Lord will allow us to see or not. We certainly don't see at depth on our own. People have tried, and they tend to talk to spirits of darkness and conniving spirits to find out about another person, but they still don't know the root causes of a great many things. So judgment I normally leave alone, because we're going to be wrong if we judge prior to our time of perfection. In Christ, we're going to be wrong. We're going to get something wrong, and the Lord said, if you judge, you're going to be judged. So I leave that whole area alone. Plus, I appreciate the grace and mercy that the Lord has placed upon my life. So I Normally, I concentrate, but in that area, I concentrate on me. I do attempt to encourage other folks, but I do concentrate on me when it comes to judgment. I don't look outside of myself. I'm not looking for somebody else's flaws or faults. I don't waste my time doing that because the Lord is raising all of us. And as we go through these times, things are going to become highly spiritually charged. And that's another thing we can never forget. All of these conventional happenings in the world, the wars, right? all of these, uh, the protests that are coming, large scale protests are coming. You guys do know that, right? People are going to be angry, quite vicious. These things will come and uh, these things will always be because people are always trying to get their own will across. But in our case, when they come, we must never forget the root causes of these things. We're the battle truly lies. You can go up to a person and stop a person from committing a crime, but you cannot take the motivation of that crime out of their hearts. That means they you can stop that crime for the moment. They may do something worse, you know, a day later. So the true battle is against the spirits that influence people. And God gave that directive to us. Do you know that? You can stop something physically, but you're not really stopping anything. All you're doing is delaying the inevitable. But if you stop the spirit from operating in the person, now you've done something. Now you've really freed someone from the bondage of darkness. And now that person will not commit themselves to act upon the darkness that often invades men. That's where the real battle is. We would do well to remember that, right? Because people waste their time. They try to change the um, uh, physicality of a person. But later on, the person just goes, or that spirit may jump to somebody else. You guys have noticed this in your home. You get one child quiet, or you end one dispute in the house, and it jumps into somebody else. Possibly, maybe you and your spouse are arguing or something like that. And you notice uh, some sort of an off spirit between you two. Once you guys get settled, it will jump right into somebody else in the household. So stopping the argument between two people, that's one thing. But if you don't kick that spirit out of your homes, if you don't deny it entry back into the home, you're just delaying the inevitable. And it will hop from person to person to person. And many of you, if you sit back and watch, you can see it quite clearly. But God has empowered you to put an end to that. You can spot these things, boot them out of your house as often as you can, and they cannot corrupt your loved ones anymore. You've been empowered to do that. But if you don't function spiritually, you're going to be drawn in by way of the flesh. You're going to have arguments and all these things will happen in your homes. If you do it according to your own understanding, you're still going to have it. You can be free of those things. You absolutely can be free of those things. But you must first seriously rebuke it yourselves. You can't agree with it and expect it to leave. Because if you do agree with it, you just invited darkness and the cousins of darkness into your life. So don't agree with it. Don't agree with arguments. Don't compensate it by saying, well, you know, arguing is healthy. No, it isn't. It's very destructive. We're not to have debate within us. There are too many Christians out there who really think debating is good. No, it isn't. Debating is just what Jesus said it was. Evil. People are full of debate. They're also full of violence. They're also full of rebellion. And you'll notice those common traits within a person who likes to argue about everything. Or they just randomly like to state their opinion or disagree. It does not edify, which brings up this point. The Lord said everything we do in the body of Christ should edify. We should edify one another, not tear each other down. Iron sharpening iron is not beating something to pieces. Iron sharpening iron is when you compliment the good in somebody else. See, there's a method in life. So let's name some facts. Fact number one, every single person on the earth has darkness in them to a degree. All right, so newsflash. Everybody on earth has a bit of darkness in them. You all have that? Everybody. And we will not be free of that darkness until we are totally deliberate. In fact, once a person is absolutely free from that, they're no longer 
on this earth. They're not among the land of the living. There was one perfect human being that walked on this earth. He came in the form of a human being, and that was Christ. Nobody else is going to achieve what he achieved as far as being clean or being clear of sin. Nobody else is going to do that. Everybody has a portion of darkness. So, you know, I hate to upset you if you thought that you had no darkness in you. Yes, you do. But what does the Lord say? That every day we die to our flesh. What does that mean? That doesn't mean you go hang yourself every morning. It's not what it means. You die to the flesh daily, meaning you're not motivated by things of the flesh like emotions. If you feel good about it or bad about it, you shouldn't alter your life on things like that, especially uh, spiritual things. No, there's so many things I felt good about that ended up being bad. So many things I felt bad about that ended up being good. I don't trust feelings. Feelings lie. And your feelings, that's not your heart. It's not to do with your heart. Your emotions are influenced externally by spirits. I know you believe scientists of the earth who deny the spirit in the first place, but I don't deny the spirit. And if you look deeper into the subject, you find out something about emotions. Emotions are a result of chemical processes in the body which are amplified by thought patterns. Your mind, your brain, something is always speaking to you. That's your platform of communication with the physical and non-physical. That's why you have thoughts. That's why you have to take captive your thoughts. That's why you have to cast down imagination. Not all of them, just the ones that would dare exalt themselves above Christ or the Father. You cast them down. So your mind is a table, like your kitchen table. And spirits come to that kitchen table to speak with you by way of thoughts. And then when you start to agree with those thoughts or you entertain somebody at the table, the moment you accept it, guess what happens? It goes down into your heart. Once it enters into your heart, it'll start to build up the more you agree with it. Until ultimately, you speak the very thing you once thought of. At that point, your heart is overflowing with that one thing, regardless of what it is. So whatever you speak, you're overflowing with. If you speak a bunch of gibberish, you're overflowing with gibberish and chaos. If you speak violently, you're overflowing with violence. Some of you, you should have known that before you um, went and threw yourself into the hands of, the, of, of certain people when you were dating. Because you heard the violence. It just wasn't against you. You, you. you guys have seen this. You ever sit down with a person, they're always talking about somebody else, but they're not talking about you. And you say, ooh, I like this person. But every time you see them, they've always got a problem with somebody else. That's a warning. You were drawn to this person, and you ignored the fact that this person was blaming everybody. But you, then the day came when you became the target. You failed to realize that what a person talks about, they're full of. They're overflowing with it. And these people were already compromised. But you had the Ken help it, and you ran to it. And it backfired because you ignored the fact that they were overflowing with violence. They were overflowing with gossip and all these other things. Never realizing that one day, because they're overflowing with it, they're going to have to have a target. And if they run out of targets, well, then there you are, all by yourself. You become that target. How many found out that's real? So we get warnings. If we would look at the Lord's principles, really investigate his writings, apply it to our lives and look at his principles, not to figure it out like we're some scientist or something like that, but look to apply his word to your life, not to solve somebody else's life, but to apply to your life, to understand who you are, to understand how you operate. You'd be shocked of how many processes you find that are constantly in motion, that if you could identify them, you could save yourself a lot of lumps on your head. You know, those cartoon lumps after one of the cartoon characters gets hit by something and a big mountain lump pops up? Those are lumps, knowledge knots. That's what they are. You can save yourself a lot of trouble. We must never forget these things. And the root and the cause of all things are spiritual infiltrators. Satan did not come uh, to Eve with a big booming voice. That's not what he did. It's almost like he stalked her. I know the Bible does not go into any deep history about the garden, but he was a serpent that says, enough, serpents do stalk their prey. He knew everything God told Eve. He knew all about Eve. And he spoke to Eve on her level, where she could understand, to defy what the Lord said. Those are serpents. Like if you go to a church and your pastor says one thing, but you got somebody in the pews right beside you. He's wrong on that one. See, you might want to get away from that person, because that person is doing Satan's job. 
period. You all see other words? That's how Satan recruits, by the way. When you're in a church or something like that, local assembly, and you begin to notice things, chances are the Lord put you there to pray for those things you notice that are not right. Not to point at them, get up and turn your back and walk out. No, but to pray for those things that are not right. That's how you make a difference. That's, that's exactly how you make a difference. That's why I'm, you know, I constantly ask people, pray for me in those areas that you may see if they're not right with the Lord, you better pray immediately and, and go to bat for me so that I don't stay in those areas. That way you do the angel's job. And if I see something in your life, I'll certainly pray for that area in your life. I don't have to tell you either. That's a beautiful thing about prayer. We have access to the throne to, to petition God for things that we see, and he will do something about it. See, I can't do anything about your life in the immediate form, because if I put my bumbling fingers into your life, I may mess up something else. And we should all know the patterns of men. Everything they attempt to fix, when they fix one thing, seven other things break down. I do not approach the Lord haphazardly, nor do I take that ability to pray for granted. So I just don't whip out prayers left and right, so you guys can hear prayers and say, Ooh, amen, I don't do that. Prayers are serious to me. Right, because you're addressing the creator of all things who's coming back to this world, who has been separate from this world on purpose for a long time so that we can live, so that his brightness will not destroy us before we ever had a chance to start being cleansed. So I know who I'm approaching, and Christ Jesus, that word goes through him. Jesus presents our prayers to the Father, or they don't get to the Father at all. So I know these things. So I'm always watchful of who I approach. By the way, that's called faith. And when I do approach him that way, having investigated things in the Word of God, not never to prove somebody wrong, but always to lift that person up. Because when you want a person free, you're not going to look at something they're doing wrong to convict them. You're going to start begging the Lord, Lord, don't let this person fall into the trap that God made. That's what you'll say. And the wiser you are, the more compassion you're going to have. I knew that so many times. I don't want people to fall into the same traps I fell into. So a lot of prayer indeed is what I have. But I always remember who I'm approaching. And when you know it, you do something that thoroughly. You you're going to always have an answer. I told you guys before, it's not bragging at all, but I just don't haphazardly approach the Lord. So all my prayers are answered, and I'm very grateful for that. I do not pray for anything for me. I don't, because the Lord said he would already take care of me. As I walked in his will, he would take care of me in those areas. So I trust this word. I need not pray for me. I need not pray for anything of myself, but I do pray for others, especially when I see them under assault. You see a person out there in the street, and they're cursing, their mouth is foul and everything else. That person is losing. You don't condemn that person. That person's losing. You see people in the world committing acts of violence and everything else. Those people are losing. They're at the gates of hell itself. And if they die in that state, having done what they did without repentance, they're gone. That doesn't bother you guys. Some people are willing to push people right into hell itself. I don't have that heart. I'm not willing. The judgment has not happened. And anybody who's willing to push anybody else into hell itself, they themselves are going to live a chaotic life because God will put judgment on their heads. And they'll have no freedom by way of Christ and the Lord himself. They'll have no freedom because they put themselves in a position to be judged. And in our present state, you don't want to be judged because you're going to be found guilty, not innocent. How many of you desire deliverance? Do you remember your own lives? When you could not get things right, don't you remember some of the horrific things you did? Some of you soldiers out there, you remember when you took a life and the feelings you felt? Why would we condemn somebody else when we cried out from the depths of our hearts, Lord, forgive me? Why in the world would we ever have condemnation of anybody in our hearts, knowing we cannot see what's going on on the inside? How many people came to you and condemned you because of what they saw on the outside? They knew nothing about what was going on on the inside. How many people came to you and said, you're not a good person because of what they saw, but on the inside, you were hurt and crying, and they were wrong, and they couldn't see what was going on on the inside. Why in the world would we turn around and do that to somebody else? It'd almost be like a prisoner serving his sentence, but he gets out two years early by some act of mercy. Then he turns around and looks at the other prisoners and laughs in their faces. Well, if I was the overseer of that prisoner, I'd put him right back into prison the same hour. Now, so you're laughing at your fellow inmates? You were released by somebody's mercy, not by your own doings. And you're going to laugh? Well, you've got to go back. You're going right back into prison, my friend, because you didn't learn anything. You're not expressing mercy. You're not accepting grace. But you're utilizing mercy as a tool to further your own agenda. Back you go into captivity. You don't think the Lord does us the same way when he shows us mercy and grace and then we sit there and laugh at 
with somebody else who has not got it yet the way we have. What do you think we keep going on this yo-yo syndrome in life? Our ups and downs, we're the ones doing it. The Lord's not, he's not doing it. People ask all the time, why do I have to go through these things in my life? You know what, half the time it's not the Father doing it. It's by way of his mandate, his decree, and his principles that we have to go back. So a lot of people, they're never freed because in their heart of hearts they're cruel and they will not recognize the mercy of the Messiah, the grace of the living God through Christ Jesus. They will not recognize but they're so ready to take a position over their fellow man and they must be abased. The Bible says God will abase anybody. Abase means to bring down low. He will abase anybody who starts going up that ladder of pride. When you start lifting up yourself, denying grace and mercy, you're going right back to the bottom. That you can't, nobody can get out of that. Because only at the bottom do you learn the appreciation and the humility and meekness of having nothing. And then when you're freed, the hope is this. When you are brought down low, when you are humbled, when you adopt those qualities of meekness, you begin to see everybody else's struggle in a brand new light. So that when you start going back up that ladder, because the Lord knows how to lift you up also, when he starts to lift you up, you'll never look back down and laugh at the people down there. But you'll pray that they find the way that the Lord extend his grace and mercy unto them also. And you'll be a willing participant in the salvation of another, not a scoffer, not a mocker. Do you guys see how that works? So we can't lose in, in, during these times. People are losing all these principles, all of these ways and characteristics. They're being lost in people. A bitterness is growing like an evil root all over the earth. And people forget about their humility and meekness. And they forget about the days when they were abased and grace lifted them up. And mercy was given to them when they did not deserve it. When they should have died, they received grace and mercy and they lived. They forget about those things so easily lift up in their own heart. They're lifted up in their own hearts to scoff and laugh and place themselves above another. That's gonna. That's causing bitterness. That's causing offense and all these other spiritual attributes of darkness to spread like an evil root and we have to be mindful of those things we can never forget those things we have to remind each other of those things to stay out of the seat of the scorner and if you ever step out of grace and mercy where you begin to show no grace no mercy to somebody else the devil's got you and he will torment you before you die because you will reap what you sow do you see how that works do you see how sneaky satan is so when you see something unfair in the world you might want to double check your emotional state to make sure you never step outside of grace and mercy and to realize that the Lord has spared you a horror today. You, None of you, nor do I, deserve life. None of us do. But it's by God's grace and mercy we have life. Never think you deserve better because you don't. You deserve worse than what you have. It's by God's grace and mercy you have better. Complaints begin when your appreciation level drops all the way down to the bottom. That's when you begin to complain, when you no longer appreciate. I'm telling you, that's a dangerous path. So look around your own life again. Realize you do not deserve that house with the hole in the roof. You deserve to be homeless and living out in the jungle where animals are getting to you. So realize this. Take another look at your home and everything where you are right now and say, Lord, thank you from your heart. Realizing things could be far worse for you. If you do this truthfully of your heart, you'll never have a bad day. Never. I don't have bad days. I do not have bad days. Do you know why? Because I know I do not deserve any mercy. I don't deserve any of God's grace. And every moment I receive it, it is a huge blessing. Always grateful. So guess what? My days are always good because I can see the good the Lord is doing in my life every single day. And when I have big losses, and God knows I've had some big ones. I look at the small, these, these losses, I call them small in the earth. I should lose everything, but I didn't. You're blessed. You have an ability to communicate. You're blessed. You have an ability to see. You're blessed. You could have been born in a different country. You're blessed. Remember those things so your heart does not get bitter because many hearts are going to become bitter during this time. They're going to become bitter because, listen, when people lose their placement and they're no longer thinking about Christ, all of a sudden you start thinking you deserve better. That's what the world teaches. That's what they emphasize as how they operate. You start thinking you deserve better and you have a complaint about everything around you. And when this happens, you begin to compare your situation with everybody else's and jealousy steps in. And when that happens, you begin to envy things. And when that happens, 
folks. You begin to scorn other folks. You begin to despise the people. And when that takes place, a full offense is entered into you and your love will wax colder and colder. Because you'll say, well, they're getting away with evil. I don't need to do a good thing. Everybody who's doing evil is in prosperity but me. And you don't know that these prosperous people are living a nightmare behind the cameras. You don't know that part. They have so bodies over to industry to be utilized of them. They don't even belong to themselves. You don't know that part. You see the outside and how glamorous it can be because that's what they market and advertise. But you compare your life to them and then you say you deserve better. Whenever you say you deserve better, you begin to look around and you start casting down every blessing you have in your own environment. If I were to look at somebody in a mansion, say I looked at another pastor who had an eight-bedroom house and I didn't have the Lord in my heart and I had a worldly eye. I would say, well, I, I should get the same thing. If I ever did that, I would look around at my own surroundings and say, well, I have nothing. Well, this is just garbage. This isn't fair. That's exactly what I would think like. That's why you don't do that. When you stop thinking about Christ, you start thinking you deserve better. You really start believing that. And when you start believing that, you start to compare your life with somebody else's. And then you become envious of what they have. Covetous steps into your heart and you will curse everything around you until it dies and when it dies you'll say oh how did i get here because you cursed it you didn't thank god for that broken table you have in the kitchen you cursed it and so when the leg fell off and it broke your leg you can't sit in the hospital saying i don't know why that heavy oak table fell on my leg that stupid leg broke and it broke my foot and leg because you cursed it you did that why? Because when you're not thinking about Christ, you forget his principles. And when you don't operate by his principles, by the way, because you believe in Christ, you exist in this world and you cannot remain alive without Christ because you belong to him. You cannot live by bread alone. That's for you. You can't do it. You truly do believe in Christ. You cannot live by the food in this world alone. You have to have God's word or you will die. Align yourself with the kingdom that you'll be a witness of God's true blessing. He will surely outdo you on anything you ever thought he would do. He will do above and beyond what you're able to ask or think. You know what that means? That means there's no way in the world you could ask him for what he's ready to give you. That's a heavy statement in it. I'll put it to you this way. He's already released things, but we keep rejecting them. He's giving you certain items that you need for your path in this world, for your servitude as being a child of the kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom. But so long as you complain and complain is in your heart, you reject everything God has for you. To reject one thing of the living God is to reject everything of the living God. To have a complaint about one thing in your life is to complain about it all. We don't get a pass in that area. Take another look around where you are. Realize that you don't deserve it, but God has been merciful. Realize that your sin should have bought you absolute and total destruction, but the Lord said no. Realize that your situation in the past, it should have consumed you. Some of you should be drunk addicts on the street with no hope of ever having anything more than a box to sleep in, but the Lord said no. The Lord said, this one is mine, and you believed. Take another look around and have a thankful heart. If there's a complaint within you, then you think you deserve better. You have to take that to the Lord and settle that. You have to jump back into his word again. You have to know the story of the Messiah again. So that's never in your heart. Because once it's no longer in your heart, you're going to start saying thank you for everything you have in your house. Even the things that don't work, you'll say, Lord, thank you for the time it did work. And I'm telling you, miracles will begin to happen. And you'll be a witness to God's goodness. You'll be so on fire from what the Lord is doing in your life. You know, I, I hear people say that all the time. They want God to be immediate in their lives. Let me tell you something. When you're thankful for everything, when you come to your senses and you realize you don't deserve anything, but you start being thankful for everything, even the broken things, even the things that didn't work out, you say, thank you, Lord. And if, if, if something was taken away, you say, well, Lord, it couldn't have been mine. But I thank you for the time I had it. When you have that thankful heart and you're no longer complaining, you're drawing close to the living God. And we know what the scripture says. You draw nigh unto him, he'll draw nigh unto you. And when that happens, everything is altered in your life. The moment you have a complaint, things begin to break, fall apart, and get destroyed. And you know I'm telling the truth. Get rid of complaints. Have thankfulness in your heart forever. 
You just can't do that by way of your mind and say, yes, I'm going to do that. No, it has to be in your heart. And when you have that in your heart, and when you're looking around, really giving deep thought to everything, you'll start saying thank you. Don't ever forget how you went against the living God. Never forget when you denied him, when you just did not witness his name before other people. Don't forget those things about yourselves. Because every so long as you remember those things, you'll say, Lord, thank you, because I deserve death. I don't forget my sin, because I know who I am. I say that statement all the time. And what that means is, I know the sins I have committed. And because I know the sins I have committed, I know there's no way I should have any favor. Everything should be far worse. I am so grateful for the smallest of things. Small things blow me away. I get overwhelmed like that. That's just my life. I don't have these days like other people have. I do not complain. There's no complaint within me because I know I don't deserve. Even the tiny I have, I do not deserve it. But that is God's grace and mercy. It's like finding the kingdom of God. And you guys remember the story about that I told you about this guy who went and found this beautiful place. He hunted and he searched and he found a place so beautiful. And there was room for everybody, but nobody was there yet. And one of the first things he did was he said, there's room for everyone here. And he was so excited and it was so promising. He could have stayed, but he said, no, nope, I'm going back to tell everybody there's room for everyone here. Because that's precisely what most of you would do. If you found a place of freedom, a place of absolute good, there's no way you keep it to yourselves. You would run, go back and tell everybody you love, come and join me. I found this place. A place where there's no more of the stuff we're going through. All that stuff is gone. It's a total different place. Come with me. That's what you would say. You would search the world. And if you couldn't find enough people that you love, your immediate family members, you go out to everybody else knowing they're part of the human family. And you would tell every single soul, I found this place and there's room for everyone. You don't have to stay in that predicament. You don't have to stay in that condition. There's a place you can be free of all of that. You would go and tell everybody. That's what happens with the gospel. That's what happens when somebody finds the kingdom. It's a treasure they're not willing to part from, but they want everybody to partake of that treasure. When you have a breakthrough in your life, the first thing you desire is that somebody else have that breakthrough also. Now, you do have some out there, they get a breakthrough, and all they want to do is utilize it to further their own agenda, to, to make themselves a king in your eyesight. Well, I'm not that person. I'm the individual who finds a place like that, and I say, everybody can sit in the high seat here. That's the goal here. And I know that during these times, if we're not careful, if we forget these fundamental things, these conditions in the Ukraine, things like war, conflict, constant political sneaky things they do. If you start to make room for that and that enters into your heart, you'll end up just like they are, bitter, full of complaints. Everything is wrong every day. There's a dark cloud following you like Charlie Brown. You'll never bear fruit. I do know that the moment you have a thankful heart for all of what you have, you capture the Father's attention immediately. And when you capture His attention, He will not fail but fulfill His word in your life. Then you become His example. Because if a guy like me could want you to enter into a place like the kingdom of the freedom I found in it, how much more does God want for you right now, this very moment? At this moment, right now, not tomorrow, today. And let me tell you guys something about God's blessings. Forget about tomorrow. That is not his principle. You know what God's decree is? First of all, he said, tomorrow's promise to no man. If God said tomorrow's promise to no man, why would he bless you tomorrow? Wouldn't that contradict his word? Yes, it would. Forget about tomorrow. He said no one's promised tomorrow. You know what that actually means? That everything he has for you, he has for you right now today, not tomorrow. That means he's willing to fulfill things today. He stands ready to fulfill things today. That's why he said, choose ye this day whom you will serve. He didn't say tomorrow. He didn't say take your time in a couple months. I'll come back. Give me an answer. It's not what he said. What he has for you, he has for you today. Every day you enter, he has something for you today. The problem is many people deny it. They deny it through their complaints. Because when you complain about something, you know what you're really saying? Lord, I don't like that you allowed this. I don't like the way you're working in my life. If you complain about your existence on the earth, what you're really doing is saying, Lord, you made a mistake. You messed up. That's what you're saying. You've messed up in making me. Who, who dare, who would dare say that? You see what it really sounds like. When you sit there and you say, well, I'm never going to be anything. What you're really saying is, Lord, all your promises on my life, they're not true. You're calling the Lord a liar. Now, how can a good thing come to anybody who speaks like that so defiantly the bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made that means with all respect and with all care you were made with all purpose with all promise 
You were sent here. Do you see how we get in the way? You see how the world can have you thinking the opposite way? That the Lord would desire you to be in this earth. Do you see what has happened? Do you see how beguiling the world is? Because through its principles, its ways, its entertainment, its advancements, its promises, you will drift away from every way the Lord has established in you. Do you see that? So if you're out here pleasing anything in the world or advancing in the world, I can promise you you're drifting away from the principles of the living God. What he has for you, he has for you today, not tomorrow. If he said you're not promised tomorrow, then everything he has for you, he has for you right now. That means stop looking for tomorrow and say, Lord, heal me. He'll heal me in the future. Stop saying that. Whatever he has for you, he has for you right now. And it's not based on your faith believing that somehow some magical stitches are going to come and hit your arm. No, it's you believing in him, your faith in him. I never try to believe that somehow by my mind I can make the broken leg be unbroken. I don't do that. That's foolish. My faith is keyed in on the Messiah. I know the Messiah can heal me. And Lord knows I've had my share of healings. I'm always healed. I live in a healing. What he has for you, he has for you today. But do you see the contrast of what happens when you start to operate in the world again by the standards of this world? You're made to be in this world, but not to operate by the standards of this world. You cannot adopt the Charlie Brown syndrome. We think we're wise in all of our statements. But So I'll share something else with you. But I want God to know something. But I'm sincere with the Father. I do not tell you. I don't advertise it. But I want you to know something. I will let you know about it. But what I want my father to know, I don't show everybody those things. Because it's not for everybody to see, it's for him. I know this is a hard one. Don't advertise your drama. That's disingenuous. When you do that before people, all you do is draw sympathy. But you're not talking to your Lord and Savior. But when you're talking to your Lord and Savior, that's intimate, not public. That's very sincere. And if you're looking for your answer from him, why would you tell everybody else? When you're around your brothers and sisters, edify them. Seek to work and labor in the fields. But if you have an issue, you can't edify, can you? That's when you go to the Lord in your secret place, in privacy. See, there's a way that we operate. Sometimes it can be disingenuous. We all know that if we start telling each other things or if I were to go out to this long, drawn-out prayer or something like that, that's advertising. When, when I'm doing one of those real prayers, I can ask you guys to pray with me. But I'm telling you right now, I'm going to my secret place. I don't do things in public like that. I just don't do it because I can't stage that. I'm no good at that. I can't contain certain things like that. There's no telling what will happen. No, I had to be in my privacy in that one. Now, people are joining me immediately. That's a different story. If we have a group prayer, then the Lord has his way. But when it's very sincere, I do not advertise. When I do a good thing for somebody else, I do not advertise. Because when you advertise, you're looking for a reward from people. You're advertising your stuff. When, when you sit there and you tell everybody the good that you're going to do, are you not looking for somebody else to recognize that? That's why you said that in the first place. And we have to learn to be genuine in these areas. Nobody really knows the good that I do because I don't advertise. Somebody could point at me right now and say, Mike didn't do anything. I wouldn't say a word because I don't do things like that for show. It's not for show. It's for real. The heart you do things in matters. Whatever the condition of your heart is, I'm telling you it matters. Because when your heart is upright and you do anything, you're doing it by way of the kingdom. That's the key. When your heart is upright in what you do, you're doing it by way of the kingdom. And the power of the kingdom is released in that deed that you do, which is eternal. It does not stop until it completes what it set out to do. You want to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You have to experience the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about what he promised. You're to be one of those that says, oh no friend, it's absolutely real. He will deliver you because you are the ones that are to be delivered. The ones with the impossible situations. The ones with the issues that nobody can solve. That no doctor can fix. You're the ones with the impossible situations. You are the true witnesses to his gospel. But you can't do that if you do not experience his direct deliverance. You can't be that person if somebody else comes and they're always your savior. How can Jesus be your savior? No. Everybody must fail you first. And after they fail, the Lord does his thing. Because this time you're not going to give man credit what the Lord has done. So all of you who have who have had these issues and nobody can solve them, there's a reason for that. You're not going to give a man glory for what the God is about to do. No, they must fail you. They have already failed you. 
Don't sit and be depressed as though you're never going to get out of the situation. That's just the way it is. That's not true. The truth is, he's not going to allow you to solve it, me to solve it, your doctor to solve it, anybody else. Nobody else is going to solve it. He will do it himself. And when he does, you're going to go tell the world. You're going to say, everything I thought would fix this fail. I was at the end of my rope and nothing worked but Jesus. Then you'll be a true witness. When Jesus delivers you, you're not going to give credit to anybody else. You're going to know he did it. And then when Satan comes and says, well, is he really your savior? Is he really going to deliver you? You'll smack Satan in the face with a hallelujah and say, yes, he most certainly will. Now flee. That's what you'll say. You're not going to give him a moment to pause. Well, maybe he won't. See, that's what people are doing now. Satan will come to you. Is he really going to deliver you? And some people are pausing this. And maybe he won't. Maybe it'll be like when I was young. Do you really think he's going to have you like that in the days of manifestation? No. So everything must fail you so that you'll only recognize Jesus as being your deliverer. And in the day that takes place, there won't be any force that will ever come and tell you God does not deliver. That's when you'll be a witness. And people will look at you and it'll look to them like everything is going wrong and you'll be smiling. They'll say, what, why, what is wrong with that person? Can't they see they're in the middle of a fire? And you'll stand in the midst of that fire saying hallelujah. And when the fire goes out and nothing on you is burned and you don't even smell like smoke and you still come out saying he will deliver, then they're going to be believers because it surely will happen. None of us are to be false witnesses, but direct witnesses of God's deliverance through Christ. So don't be afraid of the furnace. You're going to be delivered first. And in the middle of the furnace, you'll be saying hallelujah with all trust to the Messiah. And when people see that, because the flames will burn out and they see that you're not burned and you don't even smell like smoke. That's a day when the hardest of folks will give up their entire wall. They'll tear down their own walls and say, I want Christ Jesus. And they'll do that because you'll be a real witness in the earth during the hardest of days. The Lord knows what he's doing. Let us be sincere in what we're doing.